The best thing to do is to read and listen at the same time because you can do it a lot faster and you retain a lot more. Also, listening in your own voice helps a lot. And GPT T3 pre trained models for a text punctuation classification task. The distilled models are small and fast for mobile use, reduce costs, improve privacy, and every better with live speech and access on mobile devices. We've heard and delivered outcomes. All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Cliff here. Cliff, I thought a great place to start is the rise of audio. It seems like everywhere I turn, I see Amazon's audiobook sales exploding. I see, obviously, things like uh, Alexa or Siri. I see um, you know, podcasts. Everything seems to be going more and more audio. What is happening with the rise of audio? So... This is, hey, nice to meet you, by the way. I'm Cliff. I'm the CEO of Speechify. Um, here's the way to think about it. Humans have been listening and speaking for like hundreds of thousands of years. We've only been reading for like a couple of thousand. And reading is an amazing hack that people made, right? You have a couple of glyphs and you read them and you understand what they say. But when you read, you're employing about 70% of your brain decoding and about 30% actually comprehending. When you listen, it's like, 3% is dedicated towards decoding, and then 97% is comprehending. Um, a couple of things happen. Um, the first one is you have to remember that text is very easy to store. Audio is a little bit more difficult to store and a little bit more difficult to stream. You had the huge shift that happened when podcasts started to rise about like 15 years ago, because it was the first time that now everybody had a device in their pocket that was connected to the internet where you didn't need to store all the audio files on your phone, right? If you remember, you know, the big thing when the iPhone came out is Steve Jobs was like 1,000 songs in your pocket. 1,000 songs is like two podcast episodes. So you couldn't store them on the device. So one, you solve the solution where you didn't need to store all of it because you could stream it and, you know, download upload speeds came, became fast enough. And then everybody got used to having earphones in their pocket that were really mobile. And then you got AirPods. And AirPods really, really changed the game because now you're not getting your you know, earphones stuck in the door handle. Um, people carry them every single day along with your wallet, along with your keys. You have your AirPods with you. And in addition, you had a couple more changes. Number one is YouTube released double speed for YouTube. So a lot of people listen to things at double speed, right? I'm sure the majority of people listening to this are listening at 1.5x speed. So you had rise of podcasts, rise of audiobooks, double speed WhatsApp messages and audio messages, double speed YouTube videos, and yeah, audiobooks absolutely exploded. And so at Speechify, there's about 25 million people who use Speechify. The average American reads at about 180 words per minute. Um, but it used to be that most people who would come to Speechify would set the speed at 210 words per minute, which is about like 1.15x speed. We've noticed that over the last like two, three years, the average person comes in and sets it at 2.4, sorry, 240 words per minute. So like closer to 1.5, 1.4x speed. And then they build up in the first like four months of using Speechify to listening at like 350 to 400 words per minute. Um, my experience is I moved to the US when I was 13 from Israel and I didn't speak English. And so I learned English by listening to Harry Potter audiobooks 22 times in a row. And in the beginning, I would listen at like 0.75x speed because I, I was just getting used to the language. But with time, I started to listen at 1x and then 1.25 and then 1.5 and 2x and 2.5 and 3x. And then I built Speechify and it made it easier for me. to. Now I listen to most things at like 700 words per minute. So I have to coach myself to speak a little slower. Um, but that's the first segment is it's more accessible and people have trained themselves to listen faster. And by the way, listening fast is a skill in the same way that running fast is a skill. And once you get good at it, there's a couple of things that you unlock. Number one is the ability to listen and do other things at the same time. So in the same way that you can walk and breathe or walk and chew gum, most people have now learned to walk and listen to an audiobook at once or listen to a podcast at the same time. Um, I used to give a lot of talks to kids in universities and high schools and people would be like, oh, I listened to an audiobook, but like, I didn't understand it really well. I didn't like it. And I was like, well, this is the first book you listened to in an audiobook, right? You probably didn't retain the first book you read well either. So you got to listen to 10 books before you can knock whether you're an auditory learner or not. And I've never actually met someone who listened to 10 audiobooks and didn't keep doing it more. And then we can go more into AI wherever you want to take it. Yeah. So one of the things that is interesting is you can do more things, right? The downside is that you may not remember as much of it. And, um, you know, I'm a person who for years, uh, only listened to audiobooks. So like I was like the perfect customer for you and Audible and, and all these guys. Um, and I, I told a story before, but a friend handed me a physical book about two years ago and was like, Hey, uh, you should read the book. I sat down and tried to read and I could not concentrate. Like I'd lost the skill of reading yeah. the physical book. And some of it's social media and doom scrolling and, and all this kind of stuff. And, 
made me think more critically about it. And so now I, I probably do, I would say 80 to 85% physical books, 15% is uh, still audio, right? There's certain books that just, for whatever reason, I, I, I enjoy them, especially when the author is reading it, you know, something about the voice being uh, kind of unique. Um, but then I've noticed now there's TikTok videos, there's Instagram videos, and the audio that is being used here, it is kind of AI-generated audio. It is faster. It is being clipped in a way that holds your attention more. So what are you guys seeing that maybe is kind of the intersection of many of these different trends? You have kind of the, the rise of audio. You have this AI generation that you guys have really helped to pioneer with Speechify. And then you have it kind of being used for entertainment purposes that really hold people's attention and also deliver information to them. Yeah, so there's like three points you touched on. So let me hit all, all of them. The first one was regarding uh, reading versus listening. So the best thing to do is to read and listen at the same time because you could do it a lot faster and you retain a lot more. So what most people who use Speechify will do is the nice thing about it is it'll highlight the words for you while it's reading. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. But like if I go here and I open a random file, um and let me text classification whatever um and i pick like let's do like boom Hi. so also Hi. listening in your own voice helps a lot um in terms of retention um roberta and gpt3 pre-trained models for a text punctuation classification task the distilled models are small and fast for mobile use it reduces costs improves privacy and it's better with live speech detected on mobile devices Weaver and roberta Alpha, story. Dynamic augmentation for the so that's what most people who use speechify will do is actually 70 percent computer open in front of them. Um, and so people listen and read at the same time. And a lot of times what students especially will do is they'll use the scan feature, feature to take a picture of their textbook, and then they'll set the phone to the side, they'll follow in the book and they'll listen at the same time. Mm -hmm. And they get the higher attention, you still get, you know, the feeling of the physical book, because like, there's also a tactile thing that matters. Um, with regards to how we make the AI behind how to generate these voices and how to make them retain really well. Here's how it works. So AI is really just uh, statistics. It's exceptional pattern matching. And so what you do is you take 100 million hours of speaker data, right? You and me speaking, you know, Hugh Jackman saying something, whatever it might be. And you feed all of that audio into an AI model, as well as the text. And then you do a lot of fancy computer science to try and make it uh, super efficient, uh, not cost too much, generate very quickly, and also be exceptionally accurate. So one thing you spend a lot of time on is this thing called the loss function that figures out how accurate or not accurate is the actual MP3 output after you put in text. And if you get that really well, you end up with a system like Speechify that can generate almost anyone's voice extremely accurately, relatively instantly. And it takes us one third of a second to generate a second worth of audio. Um, and then you get to A-B test. So, you know, people listen to more than 6 billion words per month with Speechify. Um, and so we run a lot of tests and people tell us this sounded good, this sounded bad, this sounded good, this sounded bad. And you feed back in, back into the model and you see, well, did the person actually retain on this book or did they not retain on this book? And if they didn't retain on this book, what do I need to change about my audio output to make it sound really good? And then, so that's kind of how we started is this B2C product that helped people um, scan physical books, upload documents, read their Kindle books. You can like click into Kindle. And then we were like, okay, well, we built all these fundamental models around speech to speech, text to speech, transcription, translation, natural language processing, optical character recognition for B2C purposes. Let's also allow businesses to use this because we found that half the traffic we got was people looking for B2B solutions and half of it was people looking for B2C solutions. And so for podcasters like yourself, you know, you can hypothetically, if it was not a video component, like just give it a script and it'll read the entire thing to you. And we have a lot of podcasters that are now signing up for Speechify to do that because it saves them time. Or you can translate yourself to speaking in Japanese or Chinese or you know whatever you want. And so we added those models to a video interface that we built on the web. And you can upload whatever text you want. You can upload whatever video you want or podcast you want. And it can let you translate between text and voice, voice from one language to the other language. Um, and it just saves people a lot of time. And people have gotten used to these types of voices and kind of that's how things now, change another thing that i think is really interesting is uh let's say that we have somebody who speaks english and somebody who speaks spanish they both speak those individual languages they do not understand the other when you introduce yeah. this technology now those two people can talk to each other 
there's exactly. a lot of ramifications to that. And it feels pretty important that 8 billion people can now all speak the same language and understand each other. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but also what you're talking about between text and speech is another form of translation, right? We're now getting two different types of things to come together. And so is this kind of end result that language doesn't matter, you know, content type doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, it's just the information will more seamlessly and frictionlessly uh, kind of move between individuals, creators, audience, et cetera, and language audio, text, et cetera, just all of that stuff that used to be really high friction points kind of falls into the background. This episode is brought to you by Cal.com. What do I have in common with Chad Hurley from YouTube, Toby from Shopify, and Alexis from 776 and the co-founder of Reddit? We all use Cal.com instead of Calendly, and we are all early investors as well. Cal.com is leading the charge of scheduling platforms in the open source sphere, offering you the chance to harness the efficiency previously reserved for elite corporations and tech gurus. If you like to have your calendar organized and be able to have an efficient exchange when scheduling, but you love all of the benefits of open source technology, then Cal.com's for you. They are transforming sophisticated calendar management into an accessible tool for all via a user-friendly interface. You can customize it and you can make your calendar work for you. Use code POMP for $500 off when you set up your team with Cal.com today. Again, go to cal.com, C-A-L.com, and use code POMP to get $500 off when you sign up. Cal.com, an open source tool that allows you to take back control of your calendar, be efficient when scheduling, and make sure that no one can steal your time. You're actually, you're asking an excellent question, and the answer is yes and no. So first of all, um, I think it's Nelson Mandela said, um, you know, if you talk to a man in a language he understands, you talk to his brain. If you talk to a man in a language that is his language, you talk to his heart. It's very true. Um, and so that's, you know, another piece of technology that we're very proud that we're able to offer people. And you're right. There's a lot of nuance that you get to resolve when you have this, especially when you can keep the actual vocal intonation with speech to speech when you do the translation, not just machine translation. Um, and so we've had to spend a lot of time on our algorithms, making sure that the translation is not just accurate but it also conveys with it the semantic analysis of the tone. That's one. Two, when you have this translation that happens between text and video, technically the person can understand what the video said. That doesn't mean the person will retain on the video. It doesn't mean the person will engage on the video. And so there is a, because it's not scientific, it's more of an art, let's call it you know, a, a genius. There's a genius that some people, Mr. Beast is a great example, have of being able to create a piece of content that people want to watch, they're curious, they retain, and there's not a second where they would click off. We're not at the point where the ability to translate content from one language to another or from one medium to the other is so accurate that it'll keep that form of genius. And so you still will always need people in the mix in order to make that final judgment call that is more like a je ne sais quoi, like what, what is the thing that makes this so attractive and unique? Um, but it does mean that the AI portion can alleviate 90% of the work. Talk to me about this rise of artificial intelligence when it comes specifically to audio. Um, we've obviously seen the concern around deep fakes. We see the whole like responsible AI movement. Yeah. Um, is it a problem? Like, should we be worried about the fact that people can now clone their own voice or even maybe more concerning clone other people's voices and make them say anything? And then how do you think about if I hear an audio clip, is it real or not? Like, well, how do we start to kind of siphon through some of this stuff? Yeah, so this is definitely something that is very important um, and requires to be very responsible. So this is one thing at Speechify that we spend a lot of time thinking about is AI safety. Um, and there's a lot of technology that we built internally that we haven't yet publicly released because we do it gradually. We're waiting for the world to pick up, to be ready for it. Um, and we're doing small A-B tests to make sure that there's zero chance of abuse. Um, there's a couple of ways we think about it. The first one is we always put the content owner in the driver's seat. For example, we have partnerships with all of the top um, book publishers to resell their audiobooks and their eBooks, uh, but we only do that with permission. You can go and listen to Snoop Dogg's voice or Mr. Beast's voice or Gwyneth Paltrow's voice at Speechify. Those are things where like there are official partnerships with them. And then we have the ability to clone your own voice. And the way that we do that is we say, hey, if you have the device, and I'm speaking a unique text that the device shows me that changes over time, cool. I can add my voice. I can even send it to my friend. They can be provisioned to use it. And I can have my mom 
you know, read out my grandmother, read out my girlfriend, read, whatever it might be. I can't just upload any random person's voice and listen to it because that is not something that is secure or safe. Now, sometimes I'll get a message from the bank being like, hey, voice over IP, sign into your bank account with your voice. And I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like that, like you're asking to get hacked. Um, and so it's important to realize that these types of technologies exist. Now, one thing that Speechify, um, uh, we built internally and we're going to offer uh, externally soon is a classifier. You can upload any uh, piece of audio and we can tell you whether it was AI generated or not. So the thing to know is that um, because AI is really exceptional at pattern recognition, you can then reverse engineer any audio file uh, because it geometrically makes sense. Like the, the audio pattern is different than the audio pattern you get from a normal person. You don't get as much sound. It's less choppy. It like makes geographic, it makes sense. Um, the way to think about it is in mathematics, uh, there's a concept called a polynomial. So Y equals A plus B, X plus C, whatever. Um, and, uh, you can also think about it like images in computer science. So there's a dot JPEG, which is a bunch of pixels together. And if you expand it, it gets pixelated, but there's a dot SVG, which is a polynomial that represents a shape. And if you expand it, it does not get pixelated. The same is true for AI generated audio. And so you can by and large, always tell. Obviously, you can't tell with your human ear, but you can tell if you run it through a processor. And so that'll be, you know, a thing that you need to do in the same way that the New York Times to publish a piece of content. They need to fact check it. You need to fact check, hey, is this audio real? Is this audio not real? And is this something where like eventually Apple or Android operating systems or maybe the phone carrier, somebody will be able to like, hey, right now the voice on the phone is actually AI generated and almost like alert you? Um, this is a good question. So these types of things often take a very long time to roll out. Like think about spam with email. like you still get spam in your email. Um, and Gmail has done a really good job of fighting that, but like that'll always be a problem. Same thing here. So uh, I'm sure that the phone carrier has a, has a deep incentive to solve this problem because there are laws in the United States about you know um, robocalling. And uh, the, the more we resolve that, the better for everybody. Uh, however, I think that at the same time, you'll have a bunch of other pieces of software that let you pull the future forward a little bit for yourself as a user, if this is a problem that you care about, right? So there's a thing called Robocaller that you can download and it'll automatically stop spam calls. Um, there's a bunch of Chrome extensions that you can download, um, both by the way, for uh, your desktop Chrome. So Speechify is a desktop Chrome extension, but you can also download the Speechify mobile Safari extension that works on your iPhone. Um, you could, for example, take a screen recording, upload it to, we haven't released this yet, an app that has a classifier that tells you, hey, this is real, this is fake. Um, you know, I remember many years ago, there was a, a Mitt Romney um, clip about him talking about the 47%, if you remember this, yes. tanked, tanked a lot of his prospects. And that could have been completely faked. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that has always existed in politics and, you know, in corporate espionage. Um, and it's, it's very, very important to understand. And, you know, the last election cycle, we had so much conversations about fake news and this upcoming election cycle is going to be absolutely ridiculous. And the problem is that you are speaking to, you know, to everybody, whether they're educated about this technology or not. And so, uh, it's very, very difficult to have a megaphone to make sure that everybody is aware of how good technology has gotten. Um, and that's why there's a responsibility and an onus on companies that are able to create this content to do it responsibly. Now, here's the difference. Um, there's this like cyberpunk portion of you know the web sphere, which is engineers who just love making things that push boundaries. And they're not doing it inside of the context of a company. They might not even be based in the United States. And the way that AI works in general is we're very much focused on open source. Like everything that we make, we like to share with other people. We let them use it. We might not share the data, but we'll share the models or how we built the models. And so there's a lot of open source content out there that's not as high quality as Speechify. It's not as easy to use as Speechify, but someone who's very technical and really willing to do it can set something up, which means that you know bad actors can always do things by themselves in a clandestine manner. And uh, it's, I mean, it's not even a matter of time. It's already here. Like someone who wanted to cause harm with this type of technology, already has the ability to do this through open source repositories. And so um, one, there's a responsibility for companies that are good at this to act responsibly. And two, it's in our best interest to provide the tools to allow people to understand what's going on and to protect themselves. 
So another debate around this is, uh, will it create or displace workers? And a, a good example or, or kind of corollary is uh, in the banking sector, a lot of people don't remember, but when ATMs first came out, uh, they were like, oh, bank tellers are never going to have a job again. We're going to literally put all the bank tellers out of business. Uh, yeah. And I recently was talking to a friend about this and I looked it up. There's more bank tellers today than any time ever in history. And so right. ATMs actually increased access to the financial system, which then led to the need for more bank tellers. How do you look at some of this AI specifically around audio? Like there's voice actors, but there's also a number of other ways that people use audio, uh, either in commercial settings or for, you know, kind of personal income. And so do we end up displacing some of those people or do we actually create the need for more human voice, you know, uh, kind of components? So I'll answer your question from, from a historical perspective, and then I'll answer about today. Um, what is the difference between humans and, you know, normal animals for the most part, right? Some people say maybe it's opposable thumbs, but really one of the biggest definitions is the ability to create tools. And so every time a human creates tools, uh, society leapfrogs forward, right? Whether it be the steam engine or the plow or whatever. And so back in the day, people were like, oh my gosh, not the plow. You know, you will, you know, take us out of a job, not the cotton gin, not the train instead of a horse, um, not the computer, not the calculator, not the internet. And so the idea that technology will displace humans is fanciful. Because at the end of the day, we are humans. And so, you know, the human condition is taking tools and using them to your benefit. Now, the big problem is who controls and has access to these tools. Because you will have a situation where wealth accrues to people who have access to these tools and learn how to use them. Um, and so you gave a great example, which is the bank tellers. And so it's just a tool that gives you more leverage, right? I think it's Archimedes, uh, give me a lever long enough and I can move the world. Um, and so here's how to think about it. I was having a conversation with a really exceptional voice actress uh, not long ago. And she asked me exactly the same question. And uh, she has a bunch of contracts with government agencies, um, with companies, with the military, where, where, you know, YouTubers, et cetera. And she's limited by how many times a day she can speak. And if you speak for six hours a day, you know this, you know, your voice gets hoarse, like what can you do about it? And so I was explaining to her, listen, here's, the, I'll give you a free access to the Speechify uh, B2B suite, upload your voice, take all the clients that you currently have and send them a year's worth of work in the next two weeks. And then see whether they tell you the quality is good enough or not good enough. And if it's good enough, great. You just made like 300,000 additional dollars per year. If it's not good enough, get really good at editing your voice to make sure that it sounds the way that it needs to for that piece of content. And if it needs to be something that's exceptionally high quality, you need to make the director's cut decision-making about, you know, it should be sad, it should be happy, it should be this, it should be that. But this is just a tool that allows you to multiply yourself in the same way that Photoshop and Lightroom made it so much easier for creators to have bigger impact. Um, you know, it used to be that to make film, you need to literally cut physical film and like paste it together. And now we're doing this over Zoom and you'll be able to push it out and millions of people will benefit from it. Um, and so the key here is everybody needs to learn. So I have a friend who has a great quote, which is a little bit of slope makes up for a lot of Y intercept. It's not where you start out. It's your growth curve over time. And so if you are a person who is determined to not learn and stay exactly as you are, yes, AI will displace you, but not because the AI displaces you. AI will displace you because people who have started out at a lower position from you will pass you very quickly because they learn how to use new tools. And so there is a pressure and an onus on every single person out there today. In the same way that you had to learn how to touch type, how to use the computer, how to use Google, how to use ChatGPT, if you're not learning how to use new tools as they come out, you will be displaced, not by the tools, but by people who use the tools. Now, you mentioned that you have these partnerships with Mr. Beast, Snoop Dogg, et cetera. Describe a little bit how you guys think about those partnerships and are they making money off of it? Are they having some other sort of benefit? Is it just like, a, hey, get your eyeballs on Snoop Dogg's voice and that makes him more valuable for you know other types of um, you know uh, production or, or yep. uh, commercial engagement? How does it work? So yeah, exactly right. So we had to go and write the first contract ever for a digital licensing of someone's voice um, for perpetual use. And, um, you know, it's a mix and depending on the person. So a lot for us is like, can the person bring in new customers to speechify? So if they have a large following and they post, you know, they get a certain, um, share from those who they bring into the platform for the most part. A lot of people come to us and ask, Hey, can you just post my voice? But they consider it like the new version of Instagram verification, right? Like anybody can get verified now, but like not everybody can get their voice as a public voice on speechify. Um, you can upload your own, but it's like a very high status thing. If you can get your voice to be, you know, one of the default voices. Um, and once your voice is there, 
you build a crazy amount of affinity with your audience. So um, what's funny is like my voice happened to be one of the first voices in Speechify because, you know, I was working on it, but it's the third most popular voice in Speechify. Um, and sometimes I'll meet people and they'll be like, oh my God, like I've listened to your voice for like hundreds of hours. Um, and so you have this like very strong affinity with a person. And if you are Mr. Beast or Snoop Dogg, a lot of your business is not just um, being well-known, but being known well. And so it's having that, you know, intense relationship with your audience. And when your audience is going to sleep and you're the one that's narrating to them when they're doing your work, like you're having a conversation with them for hundreds of hours on a regular basis. Um, and so it really, really impacts uh, the level of affinity that people build um, with those partners. Um, and then the, the place where it gets really fun is sometimes Snoop Dogg will get, you know, called to do a commercial and he doesn't have time to do the commercial but he can license Speechify's voice for the commercial and still make money without even needing to set foot in the studio. Has he been doing that? Uh, this is something that a bunch of people have been doing, um, both through you know different um, uh, agencies and through just the, the web portal for Speechify. And I don't know how much you know about the individual um, deals, but are they actually getting paid the same price? Or if it is the AI voice, will they actually get paid less? So it's like more cost-effective for uh, yeah. the agency and, and the product owner as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you look at, you know, any A-list celebrity, like their day rate is going to be, you know, $800,000 for the day, whether they're on set or they're in the studio, you're paying for their time. So the second that you disintermediate, disintermediate away their time, you're just paying for the value without paying for the time. And so by definition, it's going to be a lot cheaper. Yeah. So actually, there may be a world where they start to incentivize, say, hey, actually, we don't want you, we want your voice. And therefore, 100%. it's way cheaper to be able to do and that. And the other thing that you'll see is, you know, Marvel and Disney and all these other studios, like they'll shoot and then they'll need to re like reinvite the actors into the studio in order to, you know, add dubbing, add background audio, um, you know, all that jazz. And like you're still paying the day rate. And so what you'll have is in the contract in the future, it'll say, hey, we are paying you for your likeness and your image and your time on camera, but we're also paying for a, a, an exclusive license for this movie to generate additional versions of your voice because it just allows the process to be faster. And this obviously has to happen with permission. It should not happen without permission. You're still the person who owns your likeness, who owns your voice. Um, you just need to license it. And in the same way that you license someone to use your photo, you can license someone to use a likeness of your voice. So another thing that becomes pretty interesting is let's say that I was to put my voice on a platform, somebody was to come and license it. Uh, I know that it's going to go into X movie, let's say. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I don't like the script. And mm -hmm. they made me say something that I wouldn't have said or I didn't want to say. I did license it to them, but there's nuance now. How do you see that stuff playing out? And that may be kind of an extreme example for movies. But I'm sure Today's episode is brought to you by Trust and Will. I've gone through a number of different changes in my life over the last few years. I got married, I had a kid, and I had to start thinking about how could I ensure that my wife and my child would be okay if anything ever happened to me. That's where trust, wills, and estate planning come into play. Now, most people, what they do is they get introduced to a friend, an uncle, or someone in their local community. It tends to be someone who's really expensive, a lawyer, an accountant, or somebody who does estate planning, and they just simply are using a one-size-fits-all template and just telling you, pay me thousands of dollars, and I'll use the same thing for you as the guy down the street. But that's not what Trust & Will does. They have a trusted online estate planning product that starts as low as $159, which allows you to now protect your legacy from the comfort of your own home. Leverage their excellent customer support available via phone, email, or chat. They have thousands of five-star reviews and a rating of excellent on Trustpilot. It takes most people 20 to 30 minutes to complete their estate plan with Trust & Will. And not only that, but if you go to trustandwill.com slash pomp, you'll get 10% off. Plus, you'll get free shipping of all your estate planning documents. So go to trustandwill.com slash pomp and make sure you get an estate plan in place. Whether it's for you or one of your loved ones, having a trust and or a will can literally be the difference between someone being taken care of and someone not. Go check them out today at trustandwill.com slash pomp. Um, it, it, it's exactly the same way as if you sign yourself up to be in a reality TV show and they can cut it however you want. In reality TV shows, sometimes they'll shoot over your shoulder. You're saying one thing and then you, you see you know, the back of my head, but they'll take a clip of me saying something else from a completely different thing. And the person's like, do you want to kill me? And I said, of course not. But then they switch of me saying yes. Right. They have creative license and you sign that away when you participate in any movie, in any TV show, in any whatever. So it's not that different. 
it is true that you should always only partner with people that you actually believe are good people. And if you are partnering with people who you think are bad actors to begin with, then you know that's what's going to happen. Absolutely. Talk to me about the company itself in terms of how big is it revenue-wise, number of employees, what, what data or information can you share with us? Yeah, yeah. So I started working on Speechify back in 2015. And the reason I was excited about it is I read a bunch of uh, academic papers about the narrow applications of deep learning, specifically around speech synthesis. And my thesis was, I'm going to be able, we're going to have text to speech be more than 10x better than it currently is. Like, this is absolutely insane. And I ended up writing this 30 page paper about my worldviews. And the conclusion was that I am the person I am today because of my experience overcoming dyslexia when I was a kid. And because I listened to two audiobooks a week and I've done that for like the last 17 years, 100 books per year. And I was like, this is the most important piece of technology for me to invest my time in. And this is why I'm on this earth is to solve dyslexia, to solve ADHD. Um, and, uh, I'm so lucky that audiobooks existed when I was 9, 10, 11 years old, because if I was born 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, I would not have had the academic experience that I had, but not at all. I'd be a completely different person. Um, and yet, most textbooks did not have an audiobook. And so that's what we set out to do. Now there's about a little more than 100 people who work at Speechify. We're like 75 engineers, 30 people on the AI team. My brother, Tyler, um, is actually blind in his left eye. He's astigmatic in his right eye. And so he does all of his coding on a giant projector, but he started coding when he was in third grade, uh, building Dragon Ball Z websites. He taught himself uh, assembly in fifth grade to hack video games. He skipped three and a half years of math in high school, three years of computer science. And then he did maths as an undergrad at Stanford. He did his master's in AI there. Um, and he joined the team uh, and leads the AI team for Speechify. Um, and so we both had this very big passion of making sure that reading is never a barrier to learning for anyone, no matter what your background is. And really above everything else, uh, my goal in life is to be the person that I needed most when I was young. When I was young, the thing I really needed was someone to do my readings for me. And so in the beginning, it was a bunch of people like me, people with dyslexia, ADHD, low vision, autism, concussions, anxiety, second language learners. Now that's less than, you know, 30, 20%. Most users of Speechify are doctors, lawyers, accountants, people in the military, executives, people in finance, um, who they like to listen when they drive. They like to listen when they work out. They like to listen when they walk. They like to listen with their cook. They find that they can listen two to three times faster than they can read. They can comprehend better when they listen and read at the same time. It's way less boring. So the co contingent of people who have used it the most um, happen to be people with ADHD. Uh, what's interesting is if you have ADHD, your brain is wired slightly differently. Turns out you're way better at listening fast. So the percentage of people who I meet who listen at 3x speed, it's like 80% of people with ADHD. because the speed of the listening is equal to the speed at which their mind is working and that helps them. But if you intake the text at 200 words per minute, there's a dissonance there. You get bored, you act out in class or you walk out to you know, pet a dog, whatever it might be. But the second that it's equal to your brain, which already moves fast, you're absolutely locked in. Um, and so we have the, the Chrome extension is you know, our most popular product and then the iPhone app. And then we have the mobile web product and then uh, the, the, the B2B uh, tools that we built. And so... Right now, we're like 25 million people. The goal is to go to 2.5 billion. The thing is, audio is a fundamentally better user interface than digital screens. Um, and it's funny because almost every futuristic movie that you see, the predominant user interface is audio, right? People talking to their computer. And the computer will have wit, and it'll be funny, and it'll have a nice voice, whatever. Um, and so our goal is to build an auditory operating system. We started by solving a very um, single player mode problem, which is how do you read documents, emails, Chat GPT, Google, um, physical books, and have it ha at Kindle and have it in an exceptional manner with super high quality voices, all the integrations, the ability to change speed, to play pause, to pick the word that you want to listen to. And for the most part, like we've cracked that. We've been the number one app in our app store category for about four years above the New York Times, above the Wall Street Journal. And now a lot of the investments that we're doing is, hey, Users listen to so much content on Speechify, there will come a time where we can recommend to you the most relevant material to you. So you have all these beautiful books behind you. Let's assume that you finished reading 80% of them. And some of them you stopped 25% of the way through. I can start recommending to you the most relevant books for you to read next based on what you actually completed. Exactly like TikTok recommends videos. Um, and so except for entertainment, it's for business and knowledge purposes. Um, that to me is really, really exciting. It gets even more exciting when you put it in the context of a team. So now we're launching Speechify Teams um, that knows the entire knowledge base that all your team has, because it knows that you read this macroeconomics paper about inflation as it relates to solar panels. And I read this paper about GPUs from NVIDIA. And actually, we should be the two people called into the organization to talk about this topic. Um, and so that to me is just like a very exciting future. 
When you think about audio, everything we've talked about is kind of the input to the human, right? Audio is coming in. I'm, I'm digesting the audio. Um, there is the audio interface, though. We see this with Siri. We see this with Alexa. We see this with you know a bunch of these different products. Um, is it just going to be kind of a, a, a bimodal or, or kind of two directional? I'm consuming audio, but I'm also using audio to kind of dictate my life, and and uh, that's the dominant use case kind of moving forward. So, if you want to build an AI company, and there's like 10 fastest growing generative AI companies, obviously OpenAI is number one, Speechify is often number like six or seven. Um, you've got to think where value accrues, right? And so there's two ways of thinking about it. The first one is, does value accrue to the person who has the best model? Um, or does it accrue in another place? And often that place actually ends up being distribution. Because if you have the largest amount of distribution, you get to train your models on more and more data than everybody else. Um, and so there were many companies, hundreds of companies, that were at the same level of open AI during GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3. The thing that really changed everything is ChatGPT. For Speechify, we started with being user first, and then we leaned really hard into the deep learning part. Um, and the reason it took a little bit of time is one, I was a college student. Um, and, and two, uh, audio is a lot more uh, heavy than text. And so obviously what you're going to see is first you have this bottle between open AI and Anthropic, then you'll have this bottle, bottle to see who is going to win the audio. And obviously, Speechify and OpenAI are the two leaders there. And then you're going to have this uh, fight about like text to video, because that's the next thing that is the most heavy. Um, and so it's not enough to just have the foundational models. Uh, and by the way, it's important to note that within large language models in AI, they're not all the same. Some of us are for you know, textual reasoning. Uh, and some are for audio, and some are for video, and some are for other things. So we're especially good at the voice part. Um, but it's not just enough to have the foundational models. You need to have the end relationship with the user. And so the way that Speechify has decided to build the products that we create is they sit on top of other software. So if you think about the technology stack, and you think about Microsoft, they started with DOS. And then you, so you start with an operating system. And then on top of that, you build applications, call it the App Store or the you know, Chrome browser. And then you build websites on top of that. And then on top of that, you get to have Chrome extensions like Speechify or mobile Safari extensions like Speechify or Gmail plugins like Speechify. And then we end up being the conduit for information intake. We're the last piece of technology you interface with before the information gets into your brain. And then that's the input. And now we're starting to work on the output as well. So the output is important because it helps you navigate. It needs to be able to deal with interruptions. It needs to be able to deal with sound in the background. And by the way, what's very interesting is if you're able to use Speechify's technology and you're recording a conversation like this, let's say I was in the middle of a stadium, I could transcribe my voice and then I could text to speech my voice again with the same intonation, generate the voice perfectly, but drop all the background audio, drop all the additional speakers, drop if we're in a stadium, the bouncing of the basketball, the sound, the roaring of the crowd, whatever it might be. And so you end up with these fundamentally new primitives for data on the internet. And that's really, really exciting. And so what ends up happening is the user interfaces change. You're going to have a situation in the next like two, three, four years where your AirPods will be LTE compatible and you can leave the house without your iPhone. And that's already kind of amazing because you're not addicted to this physical screen anymore. And humans, a lot of the depressions that we're seeing these days is people being sucked into these social media platforms and you know whatever it might be, TikTok, Instagram. But if you are able to still get all the value, all the knowledge, all the entertainment, all the learning without being stuck with your face inside of here, but you can look up and you can walk around and you can be in nature and you can row your boat, whatever it might be while listening. That's a far better human experience. And you can cook and you can do it. And the second that you want to, boom, you take out your earphones, your interface with your child. And so that I think is a much more exciting future than where we've been headed in the last 10 years. My last question for you is a little bit more fun. Uh, music. Obviously, people have heard you know the Kanye uh, renditions and, and many others. Um, those were people who basically were doing it more for entertainment purposes and kind of to show what the technology could do. Do you think music artists will begin to use this technology to basically say, hey, look, screw it. I can just rather than go in and record myself, use my own voice and figure out how to make you know chart topping uh, hits? Of course. So we already have a bunch of artists who work with us. Um, and it's really funny, actually. So like one really good example is a guy who... Um, there's people who they don't want to record in the studio because the studio sucks. They want to record on, the, on their phone. Um, so they record on your phone. But what happens is, you know, we'll capture the intonation, everything you have, and then we'll spit it back out. But it'll be super high quality in a lossless format because we regenerated it from scratch. So actually, it starts to not matter what microphone quality you use. And so you can record in the subway as long as the vibe is right and you get the intonation that you want. Boom, you can get it there. Um, and the way that the music industry works is you have a bunch of people who will write hit songs. And then artists will try it on during a studio session and they'll keep the one that they really, really like. And so now what you can have 
is every artist, they can just listen to a, uh, a stable of songs, sang with their voice, and then they can decide before they even actually go to record whether they like it or not. And you're going to have artists who already have a really big name be able to feature on any song you want as long as they give permission. Uh, and that's really interesting. And you obviously have uh, artists like Grimes who are publicly allowing anybody to use her voice um, and just like, you know, 50% split it. You'll see more things like this. Again, it's not a solution for creativity, but it is a solution for more efficient execution. Cliff, where can we send people to find you on the internet or learn more about Speechify? Uh, easiest place is follow me on YouTube or Instagram, Cliff Weizman, C-L-I-F-F-W-E-I-T-Z-M-A-N. I also write a lot on Medium. If you want to find Speechify, uh, search on the app store, Speechify, Speech, and then IFY, or go download the Chrome extension for Speechify. Use it to listen to your emails. It'll save you a lot of time. Amazing. We'll do it again in the future. Great. Anthony, great to meet you.